Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you at the 10th Annual Benchmarking Conference in Nanjing. My name is Bob Camp, and I'm a founding member and President Emeritus of the Global Benchmarking Network, which is bringing you this uh, conference. I'm sad I can't be with you, but I am pleased to come uh, to you via the distance learning, video conferencing capability of the Graduate School of Management at Cornell University. My objective today is to share uh, with you uh, some of our experience with benchmarking, uh, some of the imperatives uh, for it and for its use, some of the benchmarking basics, uh, the effectiveness of, of um, uh, pursuit, uh, and lessons learned throughout uh, the presentation. And I will cover three uh, mini case studies uh, to show you how significant results have been achieved. <clears throat> so here are the key messages. Uh, there is a critical need for benchmarking. Uh, in today's world, uh, we have just come out of 20 years of major change, and I see uh, almost a continuous change for the next 20 years. And the imperative then is that we have uh, the capability to understand change and to make change effective uh, and innovative. Uh, we also are pursuing a global initiative for uh, excellence uh, through the business excellence model that is a worldwide search for best practice, but not just best practices for themselves, but best practice to master them, to know how to effectively implement them and use them. And then there are the proven steps of the process, because given your careful uh, pursuit of these three steps and completion of these three steps will guarantee uh, what your success uh, and outcome. So the first step is to improve a critical process. That's what to benchmark. Second is uh, source best practice partners. There's whom to benchmark. And documenting superior practices, that means getting your arms around all of the resources available to you to understand the best practices. Those are the three proven steps that you need to be conscious of uh, complete with diligence uh, and probably go through some training. And with that, it's quite possible that we might end up with some breakthrough results. Those people who study uh, successful change say there are three things you need to do to accomplish that. First, you need to believe there is a need for change. Secondly, you need to know what you want to change. And thirdly, you need to paint a picture of what you will look like after the change is finished. We believe that benchmarking is crucial uh, in accomplishing each of those three steps. First of all, it's the gap between the internal and external practices. That's the gap between you and your external uh, benchmarking uh, partners uh, that creates the need for change. And as a case in point, we'll talk about the uh, benchmarking that we did uh, at Xerox in my 20 plus years there uh, with L.L. Bean, a um, online ordering uh, and catalog company of uh, outdoor um, uh, apparel. Uh, and we went there and co focused on uh, their warehouse operations. And we found that they were uh, processing their orders three times faster than we were. That created an absolute crucial need for change. Then we need to understand the best practices. Well, the best practices in this case were that uh, Bean was arranging their materials in the warehouse uh, so that the fast movers were closest to the uh, picking line. And then secondly, uh, they then uh, by computer directed the picker to minimize the travel distance uh, to uh, uh, fulfill those orders. And if I took uh, the complete process of a warehouse, namely uh, receive material, put it away, inventory control, pick, pack, uh, and ship, uh, if I then went and uh, expanded my search for practices across all of those uh, different facets of the uh, warehouse operation, I could uh, put together a composite picture of what we need to look like at the end of that change. Those things will almost ensure that you make change successful. Now I'm going to pause here just slightly. Uh, I want you to look at this uh, picture. It is a picture of one of the largest dump trucks uh, that is available. It's used primarily uh, in mines uh, to uh, haul um, 
uh, mine material, whether it be gravel, um, precious metals, uh, coal, or whatever. And perhaps you've seen some of these uh, vehicles or pictures of them. Notice the individual down at the bottom uh, left-hand corner. It shows the size of the truck in relation to the, the, the height of a, of a person. This is one massive truck. And for this truck, uh, the operators wanted to uh, benchmark a few of its cr critical components. And so they went and benchmarked against uh, Disney World. Now, you may think that was a tourist trip, but in fact, it was a legitimate uh, benchmarking uh, uh, visit. And what I want you to concentrate on is what, in fact, were they benchmarking? And at the end of the session, we'll come back and discuss uh, what the results were. So a little challenge there uh, to think about during the course of the presentation. The presentation is based on at least these three books, uh, plus a lot of um, uh, client uh, uh, engagements, as well as conferences uh, like these and training sessions. Uh, you'll notice the three books are all titled Benchmarking, uh, and the subtitles uh, say uh, Best Practices, Focus on Best Practices. And the global cases, uh, I will show you some examples uh, from that book uh, to show you how, in fact, uh, 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 significant results can be achieved. So is uh, benchmarking uh, a tool for performance improvement that is uh, used today? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, this is uh, information cataloged by a consultancy, Bain and Company. You'll notice that 70 to 73 percent of the companies uh, pursue benchmarking. And from time to time, benchmarking is either ranked number one or number two uh, or number three. But in addition to that, uh, the high uh, interest in it, it also has a very high level of satisfaction, almost a four out of uh, a rank of five. So it is a significant uh, approach to uh, performance improvement. And will we get results? Well, here are some of those case studies in the case study book. Uh, you'll notice that it spreads across the United States, Europe, America, so all over the world and across um, in different industries, manufacturing and service, um, private enterprise, and then the, the uh, public private, uh, entities, nonprofits, government, and education. And you'll see some uh, common names that you uh, will recognize, Chevron uh, and IBM as a case in point, and below the name is the process they were focusing on. And so uh, it's uh, significant that uh, this really is across all sectors of the globe, in all different uh, economic uh, endeavors. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, will we uh, get results? Well, uh, similarly, uh, in the case of Chevron, the upper left-hand corner, 50% uh, less cycle time, 20% less cost. Uh, and the next one, uh, which was the Statoil, uh, the state oil company of, um, of Norway, you have a 25% return for every dollar invested in benchmarking, and that is uh, fairly significant. So I think these stand as proof statements of the interest in benchmarking and the results that can be attained through benchmarking. And now we need to turn our attention to uh, understanding some of the key uh, types of benchmarking that uh, you can pursue. Uh, I like to do this by using a sports analogy uh, you remember that we just recently uh, finished the uh, Summer Olympics in Brazil, and here is one of the track and field events, uh, the pole vault. And you can see the image of the pole vaulter on the left. He's looking at the height that he has to jump, uh, and he's wondering, how am I going to accomplish that? What process can I take, and what best practices will be in that process? Well, the first thing he can do is to study himself. He can do that by having a coach uh, watch him, observe him, and then give him feedback. He can also then take a videotape of himself uh, and watch the tape and see that he's getting into the right crouch in order to get over the bar. The second thing he can do is he can look and uh, study the Olympic uh, gold medal winner, uh, essentially the competition, and study from him to see how, in fact, he uh, is able to attain uh, the Olympic record. 
And then thirdly, that is called competitive benchmarking. And thirdly, then, uh, there is the option of breaking the process down into its various functions. And in this case, the pole vault is uh, boiled down to two major functions, one running and the other jumping. And in the running uh, category, are there any other track and field events that he could study? And the answer is yes, certainly. There's the 100-yard dash, fast acceleration, uh, short distance, and perhaps also uh, the long jump. So he has a chance of looking for uh, running uh, best practices there. And obviously, in the jumping side, uh, there is the high jump. The high jump, which way to take off to get the best uh, elevation uh, to go over the bar. Um, and I guess you could ask yourself, uh, have there been any breakthroughs in any of these events? And if you recall, at one point in time, the, uh, the um, uh, pole vault was uh, uh, jumped face first over the bar. Uh, and along came an individual by the name of Fosbury, and he said, why do I have to do that? I'm going to jump backwards over the bar. And so the Fosbury flop was invented, and that uh, broke all kinds of rules uh, and all kinds of records uh, in, the, in the high jump. So there's pot potentially an opportunity for uh, some real breakthrough results, even in sporting events. But in this case, uh, the pole vaulter says, look, I want to do something about uh, my pole. And he's, he talks about uh, possibly uh, installing a spring and using that, again, as a basis for gaining the height that he needs. You may be sitting there saying, well, wait a minute. You can't do that. That's not legal. But I would say the following. Um, it's true uh, that uh, you can't put a spring uh, in uh, the equipment. But however, the uh, poles today are made of composite materials, and you recall they bend, and there is some springiness in, in the pole that helps him achieve uh, his ultimate goal. So uh, that is the uh, quick uh, explanation uh, through an example of what the different kinds of benchmarking are. And here they are uh, in, uh, in tabular form. Uh, first of all, internal benchmarking, that's similar operations within an organization. And I uh, turn uh, back my uh, recall to Texas Instruments, who um, at one point in time uh, said, we need to build a 13th fabricating plant for uh, silicon chips. Uh, and one insightful um, uh, executive said, well, wait a minute. Uh, we have 12 other plants existing. Uh, that are uh, filling the demand now. Why do we have to build a 13th plant? Why can't we go to each of the 12 existing plants, challenge them to uh, showcase what their best practices might be, share those best practices among uh, the plants, and see how, in fact, we can uh, increase productivity and potentially avoid building that 13th plant at a fairly significant expense of close to a billion dollars. Competitive benchmarking, uh, you need to compare against the, the competition, but it's not just any of the competitors. You want to be focusing on the best competitors. So somewhere around three, the top three best competitors are what you want to uh, focus on. You know what functional benchmarking is, and then there's generic process, simply an er exemplary work processes which you can find uh, almost anywhere. Now, the second one is called competitive benchmarking. The combination of the other three are sometimes called non-competitive benchmarking. And there are three reasons why you want to pursue non-competitive benchmarking. The first is that uh, there are many, many more non-competitors whom you can research and potentially find best practice partners. Secondly, they typically would be more willing to share. Uh, they do, you do not uh, compete with them directly. But in addition, they may also want to learn. And then thirdly is uh, a, a, a good understanding that uh, the competitors uh, oftentimes may not have best practices. And you need to go elsewhere to find them. 
So here's our uh, tr uh, co the copier company comparing itself to the camping goods company, uh, L.L. Bean and Xerox. And we did go to them. We visited them. We understood what their best practices were. And then the less, one of the lessons learned uh, in uh, pursuing benchmarking is even though we were a copier company, when we understood what the best practices were, we came back. We did not try to copy the best practices of this leading uh, camping goods company. What we did was we took an understanding of uh, closeness of the materials to the, uh, to the, lo to the uh, picking line and minimizing the travel distance. We took those best practices back to the operational people and said, look, we want you to see how, in fact, you can innovatively and creatively implement those best practices in our operations. And we did that. The two don't look the same, but they're based on the same fundamental best practices. So a key understanding of benchmarking. You don't copy. You challenge the organization to do better. So here's the final understanding, then, of uh, benchmarking, the formal uh, understanding of benchmarking. It's the process of identifying, understanding, and adapting superior practices in an organizations locally. Understand, perhaps, you may be uh, looking for best practice partners uh, in Nanjing and eventually throughout China, but to make sure that, uh, in fact, you're not overlooking something that may appear somewhere else, you eventually will have to do a worldwide search to make sure there isn't somebody out there that are doing things better than you are. To help your organization improve its performance, and achieve uh, business priority results. So I think at this stage you have an understanding of uh, not only uh, the interest in benchmarking, uh, the results that can be obtained, and the four different types of benchmarking uh, and the rationale uh, for their use, as well as the capstone understanding of do not copy, but get the organization to improve on the implementation uh, of the best practices by innovatively uh, implementing them. So at this stage of the game, we need to turn then to the process itself. And I mentioned there were three of them. And the first step is improve a critical process, that is, what to benchmark. Improve a mission critical process, not just any process, but one which is going to give you significant results. And how do you go about doing that? Well, the steps are identify, list the processes, and then go in and prioritize them, because you can't solve them all at once. You want to you solve the critical ones and gain uh, 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 results from that, and then possibly go to the others. Document, analyze, and develop a few key measures then are the other steps. And those are essential uh, to gain acceptance by anyone you approach to become a benchmarking partner. Because you can lay down uh, the documentation we have. You can show them your, your um, performance measures. Uh, and uh, they will be uh, interested uh, because you have done the homework. Uh, and they in, t they, in turn, can uh, understand that they potentially will learn also. So define uh, a best, uh, the, um, the process uh, is critically important to gaining uh, understanding and acceptance of, a, of an information exchange with benchmarking partners. Here's a typical um, uh, uh, diagram uh, of, a, of a supply chain process. It's a cyclical process, and the distribute in the upper right-hand corner uh, is where, in fact, we would uh, find uh, the warehousing. And that's what we focused on. But we did document the whole process. And over a number of years, uh, all of these aspects uh, were benchmarked. We also uh, documented the uh, performance measures uh, to see what kind of performance improvement we could expect. And we're comparing the data in this uh, ta uh, tabulation uh, to a, a cross-section of about 11 or 12 different companies. You see the best-in-class performance on the right uh, at the 80th percentile and the average uh, in the middle. And so uh, you, compared to that data, are the red triangles. And you can say, OK, we're fairly close. 
uh, in the comparison to six days of, uh, of uh, upside production fle flexibility. But the others show where, in fact, we need to improve. And that's where we need to concentrate our best practice search. And here's our first little mini case study. Uh, I have been impressed with some of the benchmark that's been done by the government, uh, both at the federal, the state, and the local uh, levels. Uh, but this one was focusing on complaint handling. Uh, complaint handling by citizens uh, is one of the ways they uh, uh, approach the government, either electronically or over the telephone. The executive order said, look, uh, measure satisfaction and address complaints. Uh, the learnings came from 12 different uh, best practices, not only uh, of the comparison of the different agencies that uh, participated in the study, but also 11 uh, external industrial companies. Uh, the three things that they uh, learned uh, at the highest level were make it easy for the, for the uh, 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 citizen to complain. Uh, you'll have uh, fewer dissatisfied customers. Um, speedy response also adds to customer uh, satisfaction and loyalty. And finally, if you can have the problem uh, resolved on the first uh, contact, the first telephone call, that will add immeasurably. So here's uh, the step number two, source best practice partners. That is, whom to benchmark. Uh, the objective is to source best practice uh, partners for uh, exchange, information exchange. Uh, the best competitors and func functional industry leaders are ones you're going to want to focus on. You're going to want to think laterally by analogy, generalize the concept, Remember the pole vaulter. It wasn't a spring, but it was spring e -ness. And who might have best practices out there uh, that would uh, uh, show how that could be accomplished? And uh, ultimately, you'll come down with a list of perhaps maybe 20 or 25 companies. You further research those and boil it down to uh, perhaps uh, somewhere between six and seven, uh, whom you would want to contact and say, look, uh, would you be interested in an information exchange? And oh, by the way, we can, we can supply you all of our documentation so you can see exactly what we're talking about and you can also learn from us. So where, what are the sources that you can look for uh, best practice uh, partners? Well, certainly talking to customers, perhaps suppliers, uh, research uh, in particular through professional associations. Uh, we use the Logistics Professional Association extensively. Uh, for uh, the warehouse operations, publications, and what is an annual report for? An annual report is simply uh, a document which says, we are best at these things. Uh, they talk about best practices. Uh, referrals uh, and a conference. Now think about it. Uh, you're here at this conference because you have some interest in best practices and benchmarking. Uh, it's a golden opportunity to acquaint yourself with other colleagues that are here and start a conversation around whether uh, they would also be interested in an information exchange. Obviously, award winners uh, and down through consultants who can say, you absolutely should go visit uh, L.L. Bean. And the second uh, mini case study is uh, the Statoil um, uh, oil well casing delivery out to the offshore drilling rigs. They mapped the process. Uh, they found three different models of best practice uh, you can see them down below, in-house, consignment, outsourcing. Uh, they uh, achieved a 25 to 1 benefit uh, ratio. That is, for every dollar invested in benchmarking, they received $25 uh, in return. That's a, that's a pretty hefty return uh, for a study like this. And a key learning on their part was do not become obsessed with data. Find the key top-level uh, measures that will show you there is a gap uh, and, and then focus on the uh, best practices. In fact, in my opinion, uh, data is probably worth 10 to 15 percent of your grade. The other 80 to 85 percent of your time has to be spent focusing on the best practices because they tell you then how you're going to achieve those numbers. And finally, document superior practices. Uh, exercise all the information sources that there are. Uh, this is a matter of doing searches uh, of information sources and ultimately 
leading up to potentially a site visit. And here are some of the ways that you can uh, conduct some of these searches. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all this data. It's a very busy chart. But I would simply show you, uh, point out to you that on the left uh, are the full formal benchmarking projects, some that take anywhere from three to six months with a team of anywhere from four to five people uh, possibly working uh, uh, part time. And all the way to the right are informal uh, contacts uh, where you simply want to get an indication of whether you're on the right track. But I, what I really want to have you focus on is the middle com uh, column, which says best practice reports. We have done a great deal of benchmarking. Over the years, there must, there must be hundreds, if not thousands, of, of reports uh, filed electronically somewhere uh, that you can access, either through professional associations or literature searches that would be cited in an article or the like, I urge you to go and find those best practices as a starting point to at least marshal all of the evidence of best practices that you can pursue uh, in your benchmarking project. And here's finally the last case study. It, it involves Xerox. Uh, we focused on the supply chain, which is the movement of supplies out to the manufacturing through marketing, and in the case of the high-tech industry, handling returns. Uh, our approach was to look at worldwide and redesign the process. We did internal benchmarking with our, with our colleagues uh, in Rank Xerox in the UK and also in Fuji Xerox uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we also visited a cross-section of exemplary companies that we had very carefully researched and approached with uh, all of our data and information uh, to incent them to want to participate. Um, and the results, well, we had significant increased asset turns of our inventories uh, by about a third. That in turn, along with the other assets the company had, uh, reduced the overall return on investment by somewhere around a percentage point, plus or minus. And that was significant because uh, the employee um, retirement program was funded by the improvement in the return on assets, so everybody in the company benefited by this benchmarking study. Okay, we've now covered the three steps of the process, and I think you understand them, and the, uh, the summary is do those with diligence, because oftentimes I have people coming to me and saying, we've done some benchmarking and we are dissatisfied with the results. And I say, show me your documentation. Show me how you did step one, step two, and step three. And invariably, I find that that had been done uh, with uh, not the uh, amount of detail that was important, and that's where the problem lay. So as a wrap up, what can we say about uh, the future? Well, the process will remain the same. I don't see a way that we can change uh, going through especially the first three key steps. However, we can do it with elect electronic documentation and sharing and do that uh, more quickly, perhaps more accurately, uh, and have that uh, easily uh, transmissible to, out to our benchmarking partners. It'll probably be less costly, it'll be done faster, uh, perhaps a little uh, less formally, uh, but uh, that depends on your level of interest. Um, We'll use uh, real-time interactive meeting technology like we're using right today uh, with this uh, presentation. Uh, fewer efficient site visits uh, via, via video conferencing. However, uh, I believe that an on-site uh, visit to a company uh, is very, very essential uh, selectively uh, in confirming uh, the data uh, and what you see, as well as per perhaps giving you some, per some peripheral uh, view of things that you uh, would not other have otherwise have seen. Um, so prepackaged best practice learning case studies uh, we already uh, covered, and that would be essential also. So this is a strategic strength when practiced and a fatal weakness if not pursued. It's a critical tool for how you run your business. And here's the view of a CEO. The prime objective of benchmarking is to understand those practices that will provide a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Target setting is secondary. Notice the emphasis on the practices. Target setting, namely data, is secondary. 
So I need you to do some benchmarking. Thank you for your attention. And now we need to cover the results of the mine haul truck. Well, uh, you may think about the operation of the mine haul truck. Uh, perhaps it was the scheduling that was what they were after. Uh, it might have been um, something to deal with um, uh, the um, uh, queuing. Uh, of the trucks, uh, you know, when they're uh, getting ready to be filled and, and then dumping. But there was one, cr one critical component uh, that they uh, focused it on, and that was the ability of the truck to dump the bin. And that, of course, uh, depends on hydraulics. And all of the Disney characters are run with hydraulics. So the uh, people at Disney were excellent at uh, hydraulics. They mastered hydraulics, and there really was a legitimate reason to go and visit them. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference uh, with my colleagues.